Hi Niall. Hi yeah. Jim. Tell us a bit about yourself. Um, yeah, just a bit of background. I know most people in here, but there might be a few I don't know. Um, I'm originally from Northern Ireland. I think my accent gives it away. Um, I moved to England in 1998. Um, and the reason why I moved to England is because I went through um, a number of really traumatic um, things that had happened. Um, but like James, I was beat up and left, left for dead on the street. Um, because I was the wrong religion. Um, I also had a friend of mine who was um, shot in a pub beside me. Um, so after these things happened, they were quite dramatic, and I decided, you know what, I, I just need to say goodbye to Ireland, uh, move over here, start a new life, forget about it. Um, and I did that, I moved in 1998. Um, what more can I say? Um, I moved here, I thought everything was fine, but I hadn't actually dealt with those issues. Um, they still followed me, and they still follow me to today. So, mm. what about you, Jim? Well, I grew up in Yorkshire. I was married, I got a son, I got a granddaughter. I'm a, gra I'm a proud grandpops. Uh, I moved to London in 1999, when my marriage pretty basically broke up um, and basically I made a Christian commitment when I was 18 when I was in the wrong Navy um, so that was an interesting time because also making a Christian commitment but also realizing that I was gay and in the Navy because then back in those days it wasn't allowed so um, but I managed to serve 16 years of undetected crime. <laughs> um, but yeah, moved to London in 1999, went off to college, went to university and qualified as a nurse. Okay. Mm. Over to you again. No, it's you. I just asked the first question. <laughs> um, so when well, did you first start using drugs and, and what was your reason for using drugs? Um, it was quite surprising actually. I, I remembered today kneeling in a shower unit while I was tiling it exactly the day I started. It was Easter Sunday, nine, uh, 2003. Um, <coughs> I'd been to church, to the evening service, but um, in the afternoon we kind of arranging to meet up with these, these guys. And um, so basically, as soon as the church was over and so forth, I hot-footed it down to um, Norwood, I think it was, but anyway, to where it was. And I didn't realise it was going to be a chemsex party. So there was only going to be, what, four of us in total. But on the way there, they said, oh, are you OK with chems? I said, well, not really use it, but, you know, try. Um, so the first thing we started was actually some just some pot, just spoken a few spliffs and that lot. But then the ketamine came out. Um, and yes, it was an um, interesting experience that first. <laughs> oh God, my nose! Who's? <laughs> um, and then the kick. Um, but. From that, uh, I got tuned to a relationship with one of the guys who was there, and we were together for seven years. And that was basically our drugs of choice with a bit of ecstasy, thro ecstasy thrown in. Um, and just about every night, we, we lived in a house with his ex, but we had our own bedroom and so forth, the TV and that lot. So we used to go up there every night and. Ah, munchies, and the old pot and that lot. But Wednesdays and Sunday nights was our play nights because the the um, guy that owned the house, he went off and did his karaoke thing, so we knew we had the house to ourselves. Um, I suppose after that relationship ended, there was this kind of void. Um, and um, 
And I actually then met up with this young guy, he went out to, out to zone six, it was, out there. Um, I suppose I didn't continue to use drugs between the time, but you know, met up with this guy and he introduced me to crystal meth um, the hard way, i.e. he slammed me, so he injected. Um, and it was then that we got into a bit of relationship, but that wasn't a completely fantastic relationship. Then the, another guy. So it kind of went on to there, but you know, the, um, the GBH and the methadrone and that lot all got mixed in with everything as well, you know. And there was quite a few parties at my place, but I quickly realised, you know, zone one is a lot easier place to get people to than zone six. So basically my place just got used as a party mansion. <coughs> and why not yourself anyway? Enough about me. Um, I think the first time I ever tried drugs was just before I moved over um, to England. Um, I had <coughs> mo moved into the flat with my bo then boyfriend um, and he was very into smoking weed and stuff and I'd never smoked in my life before. Um, and I remember him offering it to me and again I think it was peer pressure and I did it because I thought that was the thing to do. Mm -hmm. Um, mm. So I remember taking a couple of puffs from this, uh, from w the weed and going upstairs and then just lying on the top of the landing on the floor and s just spinning round and round and round. And um, yeah, my, my first experience wasn't very good and I kind of, I think it was the combination because I didn't smoke mm -hmm. and then it was the combination of the smoke and the weed. So. Um, yeah, it wasn't a good experience for me and I kind of, it was never my drug of choice from then onwards. Um, and even when I walk around the streets of London now and it's, it's so prevalent and even out in Chiswick, um, I can walk down my street and I can just smell the smell of um, cannabis and it's just, just horrible. So it is. Um, so then I m when I moved over here, then I was going out with a guy from Brazil for a few years um, and I always find gay sex really really difficult mm. because of my background um, so I would only ever have sex when I absolutely had to have sex um, because afterwards then I really struggled big time with the guilt um, so I would have had maybe one night of sex I would have had 10 days after that where I was just going to crucify myself because I was going to hell um, and I couldn't really get out of that loop and it kept going and kept going um, and I ended up I only I only had sex when I when I kind of craved that intimacy mm. so it was not mm -hmm. you know the actual drugs that I craved but the drugs yeah. initially when I started yeah. using them made things easier yeah mm-hmm um, and that was truth, you know, at the start it was really good, it made sex a lot easier, it made sex a lot longer, it made sex, yeah, <laughs> you know, two or three days type thing. Mm -hmm. But um, I progressed really quickly on from ecstasy uh, to ketamine, then to speed, um, on to cocaine, and then within the last three or four years ago then I made that jump to crystal meth because crystal meth was then introduced to London mm. um, and it's a completely different kind of drug mm -hmm. completely different oh. it does, it's not the same as speed cocaine any of the other one because it actually works on your psyche part of your brain type of thing um, so it's very very dangerous um, I remember speaking to somebody and asking them how can I describe what X, what um, crystal meth does to you, to your brain, um, to somebody who has never used it, and I'm not talking about the high. No. So um, I'm talking about if you think of everything so. in your life that is a red traffic light mm -hmm. that you would not do. If you take enough enough crystal meth, they all go it green. will change that to green, mm. 
and you know, we had an example mm -hmm. you mentioned earlier of um, a person who lived close to you who murdered mm -hmm. um, a policeman um, that's what crystal meth does mm -hmm. if you continue to use it your body will crave more and more and more mm -hmm. to it and it doesn't matter what anybody suggests to you mm -hmm. it will be okay um, a few of my friends have died from it um, one guy went out and hung himself <coughs> the next day because of the thoughts that he had the night before mm -hmm. so it's very very dangerous mm -hmm. um, so Jim what effect did the drug use have on you firstly physically um, physical wise um, Obviously, with the crystal meth and that lot, it used to be used as a, um, for diet control. So, you know, I was putting a few pounds on, so. You know. <laughs> but you can literally go for days without eating, and that's what I found. Um, and and uh, the worst thing is also drinking. You just actually don't bother. And you can go two, three days, you know, and particularly with food. Um, at the end of a session, at, I'd take about two mouthfuls of some cereals and think, oh my God, no, I can't eat anything else, you know. Um, so there was that, you know, that whole thing. Um, so that was the main kind of physical thing that kind of affected me on that side. I thought, oh, I am trying to look a bit trim here, you know, oh, it's quite good, you know. Um, but, um, yeah, what about you? Um, yeah, the crystal meth was used in America as a weight loss drug initially when it was introduced and mm -hmm. they had to withdraw it because they seen how it affected people's brains um, and uh, the reaction they got from that. Um, physically, um, I started slamming. We use slamming mm -hmm. as injecting. Yeah. So, um, and I had just met this guy in London who lived in Labrick Grove. Um, and that was my first time that I used crystal meth mm. um, and then i had been going out with him for about six months and he rang me one day and he said to me um, oh you need to go to um, the hospital and I said well what for and he said oh well I've got syphilis oh. which is mm. an STI mm -hmm. um, and I thought, how do you get syphilis? Because I was a little bit clueless at that stage. I found out what he had been doing is, um, he, had, he was my boyfriend, but he was going out to the likes of the fort and back street, having unprotected sex with anybody and everybody and their mm. own drugs coming back to me. Mm. So um, I ended up um, becoming HIV positive. Mm. Um, but crystal meth does something to your mind as well. When I became positive, I believed that I deserved it and mm -hmm. I believed I deserved to die. And that's the, that's the kind of impact eventually if you use enough crystal meth that it has on you is that you want to die. Yeah, it's that mental, so, the way. You be, yeah. yeah. Um, you know what, and it's just, I went from there and, uh, and I became so careless because I felt so little of myself. I mm. felt that I was just a piece of dirt on the ground, mm. um, that I didn't matter. And I remember lifting needles when I was using and I didn't know whether they'd been used before or mm. not. Um, it is irrelevant to me because I wasn't worth the life that I had now. So mm -hmm. if I died in the process, then that would be a good thing. And that's the way my mind programmed for mm. years. And I used to get up um, every morning and look in the mirror and say to myself, I hope today is the day that I die. Mm. Um, I ended up catching um, hep C twice. Um, thank goodness I managed to cure it. Um, the second time I did the, did, did the cure, I didn't want to do it until I knew that I was free from drugs. Mm. So I held back and I waited mm. for a couple of years um, before I knew that, so yeah. that when I would th go through it again, um, because it's like a silent killer, and yeah, yeah I didn't want to go through that again. Mm -hmm. So, how did it affect you mentally, Jim? What was the impact? 
Um, well, having very low self-esteem, you get this stuff racing through your body and you think you're champion. You know, um, so it helps get rid of those kind of feelings. It help get rid of that for a time. But you quickly realize that everybody else also thinks they're the champion there as well. And everybody else thinks they're Superman and everything else. Uh, if you're in groups or parties or, you know, but it also can make you very paranoid, paranoid, you know, um, thinking people have got cameras in my flat, you know, looking in and so forth and um, making sure blackout blinds are down that people can't see and things like this, you know, and um, thinking that people, you know, waiting at the door and um, it, it gives you a freedom, but it also has that sting to it that you, you start thinking all these, you know, crazy things um, that, that is, that's going on. Um, I've had one time, you know, guys thinking that there's cameras in, in my flat watching us and all this, stuff, you know, and, um, but it also mentally, you, you, you never feel satisfied. Yeah. You never feel I've <coughs> achieved it. I've done something. You always want more, want more, want more. Um, and you're saying when you're feeling like a bit of meat, um, you'd be on the chat lines or whatever it is, you know, just seeing, who, you know, because if if you if you got another guy there, then we'd all have to slam again, you know. And a bit, a bit, a bit more fun, but you know, who knows what was sticking in our veins? So um, that was the whole mentality. It was you know, it made you feel like Superman, but it also made you whoa, mm. so paranoid. Yeah. Well, for me, um, what I find is that people that use crystal meth and especially LBGTQI, whoever in that group. Mm. You know, a lot of us suffer from mental health issues because of the way that we've been dealt with in this world, because we've been rejected by our parents, because we've been rejected by our church. And all this stuff builds up. And what I didn't realize was that I had loads of mental health, health issues and PTSD from the murder that I, of my friend that I witnessed in Northern Ireland, etc. cetera. Um, and those things had all been building up. Mm. Um, just recently I, I started seeing a psychologist two years ago and I remember saying to him that I've never had a dream so it's not just re having a dream and remembering and not remembering a dream but from the year 1997 when those events happened I never ever dreamt mm -hmm. and it was because of PTSD tends to stop your brain filtering stuff through um, the night when you're in your REM sleep um, but thank goodness that's not the case anymore. Um, but yeah, it, it basically I was self-medicating with drugs to mm -hmm. try and deal with my feelings and my mental health issues um, that I didn't think I had at the time, but I did now. Um, I remember going to St. Mary's Hospital once um, and seeing the psychiatrist there and psychologist. And then they made me... Um, go and see the guy who was in charge and he turned around and he just shook his head at me and he said to me, I really don't know what to do with you. Mm. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I, you know, I've told that to some people who are doctors and, and nurses before and they're saying, oh goodness, they shouldn't have said that to you. That was really, really, really bad. But you know what? It wasn't really bad because I knew what he meant mm. because I knew that he couldn't work me out because I hadn't told him that at the yeah. weekends I was going out and using drugs. Mm -hmm. So I was taking ant, um, antidepressants yes. uh -huh. and then I was self-medicating with drugs as well and it mm. doesn't work at all it's you know it's it's, it's really really bad um, the fact of me mentally it, I became more depressed mm. um, I hated myself even more I loathed myself even more um, and suicidal became a daily thought for me mm. and even towards the end when I was using I used to if I was at one of these sex parties 
I would have filled my syringe with a little bit extra more that I would normally take. Mm -hmm. And that was building up and that was building up. And I was hoping mm -hmm. that when I injected it, that I would have a heart attack and die there and then, because mm -hmm. that's what I wanted. That was my only way that I seen out. Mm. Um, so what about, how did it affect you spiritually? Um, I stopped going to church. Um, I suppose p part of it, when it first, you know, in the seven year relationship, it was down in, in Streatham, or St. Retham, as I'm calling it now. Um, and as I said, Sunday night was our night of fun. So, you know, church went by and by. Um, so it affected that joining with the community, you know, joining with people. Um, it, since then, you know, I, I would just make sure that um, if I was going to be going to church that, you know, I, I don't think I ever went completely wired. I may have been coming down off the stuff, but I'd still go to church. Um, it's blocked the kind of communication. You know, it, it just takes you on, takes you on another tangent, um, and all the thoughts of God. You know, they 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 go. You you just don't longer have that relationship. Or I didn't didn't I just didn't have that relationship. You know, I always found quiet times almost impossible. Anyway, and reading my Bible and things like this. But you know. If you're playing for two or three days in a row, then you know God just no, no thought of it. You know, um, and you said it then the, the guilt and so forth that comes on that, and yeah. you're supposed to be doing stuff at church and things like this, and um, so spiritually, it had a, a real dampener for me. Yeah, what about you. Um, I think the thing that I noticed at at the start was that I stopped praying and I think the reason why I stopped praying was because I don't know I just find it really difficult to get on my knees thinking about what I had been up the weekend before mm. um, and obviously as week goes by and week goes by it becomes easier not to pray mm -hmm. I stopped going to um, the church as well um, usually quite okay about reading my Bible but that stopped as well I put my Bibles up on the shelf and they hadn't been mm. away from the shelf in reality what it did for me is using crystal meth cut off my communion completely with God mm. and I couldn't have any communion with God mm. when I was using that stuff and that was one of the things that really when you're on it, when you're on the come down, you think of these things. Not when you're on the high. Mm -hmm. So when you're going the come down and you're going through that depressive state type of thing, um, it's a yeah. It's 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 one of the things that always came to my mind. I was trying to remember a piece of scripture today that was in the Old Testament when. Um, there was somebody I can't remember who it mm -hmm. was um, but they wanted both the world and they wanted God and they wanted both and um, God turned around and said to them and that wasn't possible that you had to choose one or the other uh, and I knew that if I continued to use mm -hmm. there was no way God could be in my life in any way mm -hmm. whatsoever mm -hmm. yeah so but um we stopped. So how did you stop and really what made you stop wanting to use them? Um, in September 2005 I was at work and it was sort of had begun to play on my mind that I was using and I wasn't really, you know, some people sort of says, well, what makes you an addict? Is it somebody who uses every weekend? I don't think it is. I used every four to six weeks, maybe sometimes every two months. Mm -hmm. And I always paid for it. I always had the money. It never caused me yeah. any debt. So I was basically a f like a functioning addict. No mm. one in my life knew anything that was going on. Um, so I kept that very much a secret. 
Um, but I remember in September 2005, God had been on my mind a lot. And I couldn't concentrate that day on work and I got up from work and I went into the men's toilets and I got down on my knees and I prayed to God and I said, God, please help me to stop. Mm. And I said, if it's not your will for me to stop, then please take my life yeah. because I don't want to do this anymore. Mm -hmm. And um, Shortly after that, I found myself standing under the Millennium Bridge one night um, after work. And I put my computer bag down on the pavement and I got up onto the wall and I stood with my back to the wall or to the, the tide and the tide was in, it was really, really cold. And I, said, I closed my eyes and I said to myself, right, if I just fall back, mm. then I'll have that initial shock of the cold of the water and then there'll be the darkness, and then it'll be over. Because I thought to myself, you know what? I want to stop so much, but even if, if I went to hell in that moment, mm. then at least I would not be offending God in any, more, any way, and that's why I was so determined to stop, even to the event of taking my own life. Um, the strange thing about it was, there's a guy, um, some of you might know him, called Kevin, who I met once before. We exchanged numbers at some support group. And I got a text message from him just as I was about to fall backwards, saying, hi Niall, what are you up to? <laughs> and it's like, I'm about to kill myself. Oh, what do I say here? I'm about to kill myself. <laughs> I'm about to fall back into the River Thames. Anyway, um, he started up a conversation with me, and I believe that that was the work of God. Mm. You know, I don't know when God's time for me is to go, but it wasn't that time, and God used that text message to stop mm. me from actually mm -hmm. going. But you know what? I continued to use for the rest of that year on and off. Mm. Um, and it came to um, December and I got a bonus, 300 pounds bonus, it wasn't very much. And I thought, oh, mm. <laughs> and that's the most I ever spent on the drug mm. was 300 pounds. Um, and I'd met this guy on a Friday night and he was just everything that I ever wanted him to be. So we ended up having sex from all day Friday, mm -hmm. all day Saturday, mm -hmm. or all day Friday night, all day Saturday, all day Saturday night. And then the drugs ran out in the early hours of Sunday morning. Mm -hmm. And I said, to, I said to this guy, let's just go to bed and we can just, you know, cuddle in bed. And I was kind of happy with that. And he said to me, no, Niall, he says, I'm gonna go home because he says, I'm an addict. And he says, if I stay here in your house, I'll wait till you fall asleep and I'll steal stuff from your house so I can buy more drugs. Mm. Um, kind of, so that kind of really cut me to the bone. Anyway, um, I had a guy that was staying in my house temporary at the time and um, he didn't like me injecting. And he said to me, can you not just do that no more? And I thought, well, okay, I'll smoke it instead. The problem with smoking crystal meth is you mm. don't know how much you're actually putting into your body. Yeah. With, I'm not, not encouraging slamming, <laughs> but, but at least I knew what my <laughs> limit was, or if I wanted to go over my limit, I knew how much I could go over it, but with smoking, you don't. Um, mm. And that night, I remember saying to him that I felt that there was somebody else in the room that night. Mm. And this is um, psychosis, which is what you very often suffer if you use crystal meth. Mm. And you can just see somebody in your peripheral vi vision just about here, and yeah. you can sense. And when mm -hmm. you turn your, your, they're gone. Yeah. Anyway, I went to bed that night, and I woke up on the next morning and afternoon. It was about two o'clock in the afternoon. I got up, and I had lost my memory. Mm. I didn't know who I was. I didn't know where I was. I didn't recognize my cats. 
didn't recognize the flat. So I was creeping around the flat looking because I didn't know if there was somebody else in the flat with me. Um, and then I looked outside and I didn't recognize outside. I thought, couldn't say I'm in foreign land somewhere. Somebody's kidnapped me. I mean, this is what psychosis does. And it's, it's, it's not just a, an idea. It's something you actually, mm -hmm. you would swear to it that that's the truth, that you believe it. It has actual effect in your brain. Yeah. Um, so I seen this guy, he was on the computer and I'd had a conversation with him and I typed in the message and I said, do I know you? I mm -hmm. said, I'm in somebody's house, I don't know where I am. He says, nine, he says, I was at your house a few hours ago. He says, I'm gonna ring the ambulance for you. And I said, oh no, 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 don't ring the ambulance. Mm -hmm. Anyway, it turned out to be that I lost my memory for four days, not knowing who I was, where I was or anything else. And that was really, really, really scary. Um, And then my housemate, who was also using as well, turned around and told me in the early part of January that I had a problem. Mm. And I just turned around and said, F you. Mm -hmm. I'm not the person who has to go out and have a, a bowl every time I go to a job, go to my job on a Monday morning. I can, you know, I only use it every once in mm -hmm. a while, but that wasn't the point. Mm -hmm. um, I did have a problem, but I spent the next two weeks in the beginning of January 2016 trying to work out, well, if I smoke it, and if I just use this, and if I do it, mm. that, and mm -hmm. the end of the day. Um, a bit of bartering here, there, and everywhere. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I just realized, you know what, it's either stop mm. or don't stop. Mm -hmm. um, and I went to, um, some of you might know, be aware of a um, LBGT um, drug service called Antidote. You know, Antidote are about managing your drug habit so they won't tell you to stop. Um, but I made very clear that I wanted to stop when I went mm. to see them. Um, and I was in such a bad way the night when I went to see them that I just cried my eyes out. None. They weren't gonna let me go home, they were gonna get me put into the hospital. Mm -hmm. I was in such a bad way. But my first NA meeting that I went to was on a Sunday night and I walked up, um, I was walking up First Street towards the NA meeting and I got this phone call. So I answered the phone call and it was my dealer. I thought, mm. wow, that's strange. She never calls me. It's always me that calls her. Mm. They don't normally do the other way around. Yeah. And she says to me, oh, Niall, she says, I've got a really, really good offer on to the minute. We've got this new stuff out and it's absolutely amazing and you'd love it and all the rest of it. They'll give it to you at a special price, etc., etc." Mm -hmm. And this voice in my head said, this is your decision. Yeah. So, as I was speaking about the person in the Bible, I believe that I had a choice then to make that was going to affect me the rest of my life. So I either stopped, mm -hmm. or I continued to use, I continued to use, then the only thing at the end of that would be death. Mm -hmm. So I turned around and I said to her, I says, listen, I'm not using anymore. Yeah. I says, can you take your number out of my phone, or your, my number yeah, out of her phone? phone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, to which she said, yeah, not a problem. She says, hope it goes well and all the rest of it. And she says, oh, if you know of anybody else who wants kind of, you know, <laughs> just give them my number. I was on my way to an NA meeting, so you could imagine how many people wanted my number. <laughs> so, mm. <Yeah>. anyway, <laughs> um, what about you? Um, the thing that made me stop in the end was actually the loss of a 15 year relationship, a friendship. Um, it would have been what, May time last year, I think it was, but um, this guy, anyway, um, I did a lot of work in his flat. I actually nursed and looked after one of his partners as he was dying and at the funeral and was there when stuff, so we were, kind of really close. We never had um, intimacy together, but you know, we, we were really close and so forth. And I never really clicked that he used, used chems either uh, as well. Um, it's strange, it, you can get actually blinded to things like this. 
when I did click, it suddenly made sense of some of the strange things that happened while we'd been together and everything else. Um, just backtrack a little bit. Uh, there was a, a time when I was with another guy and um, we were using the have a lot and I thought, no, you know, this is getting too much. I want to I want to rest, you know. So I said to my then partner, I said, look, I'm going to stop using for a month. And his kind of reaction was, well, what am I going to do? So I said, well, I hope you'll join me, you know, because we are using so much of this stuff now, you know. Um, and he he didn't want to. And even our dealer said, hey, guy, you know, you, you used to have a lot of stuff here, you know. So even our dealer was getting concerned about how much we were using. Um, and it was, so we get back to the original guy with his, with his friendship. We quite often went to, off to Bath, went to the, um, around there and you know, I had a great dying. And we would go in this time supposedly to celebrate his partner's birthday. Um, there was six, no, three, five, six, eight of us. So we were in kind of three separate rooms. And, and I don't know why, but for this, this time, I, I, I turned around to my friend and said, I hope there's gonna be no drugs there, it's, you know. I don't know what may, may me say that, but I just said, I there's no, gonna be drug, no drugs there. Anyway, I got to the station, was waiting for them, waiting for them, and they didn't turn up, so I jumped on the train and got down to Bath, and they then followed eventually later. Um, but they kept disappearing off to the toilets and that. And we had to wait because we arrived, we got in Bath early, so we couldn't go to the hotel till mid-afternoon. The friend's partner blew up because he was um, sick of what was going on. He clicked, you know, what's going on. The reason they'd missed the train is that they were all wired out their head and they, you know, missed the train. Um, and he was going to go back, come back to London and so forth. I said, no, you can't come back. You know, it's your birthday and this, that, other. it's your special day and, you know, it's a special few days. But anyway, long story short, um, one of the guys there who was actually with my ex, who um, he was seeing while he was seeing me, was there and he, start, he was being spread in rumours that I actually am a violent man. I put my last three uh, boyfriends in hospital. I beat them up. I broke a homeless guy's legs and put him in hospital. Um, that I shouldn't be, you know, and he's, he was saying these things, you know, and I, I, sh I shouldn't be trusted at all or anything like this. Um, and so the three separate rooms with the idea was there was going to be a playroom, a kind of uh, food room, and then there was the special room for my friend and his partner. But obviously when our room, which was one of the ones where the food or something was supposed to be, you know, we didn't get into the drugs and so forth. So it you know, changed around, but we eventually went up to the room and with the cake and the champagne and so forth that we'd lugged around and walked into the room and it just felt like being slapped around the face. Because even though they'd been smoking the crystal meth in the bathroom and the thing, it was just in the room. Anyway, we up there for a little while and we all, then there's three of us, there was a, a Thai lass, um, a guy from up north and myself in this room. The young guy was then started vomiting and he was saying, oh, you know, later in the morning, he said, God, this is what meth does to me. I haven't taken any, anything in that lot. And the young Thai lass was saying, oh, I don't feel well in that lot. And I was saying, woo. I thought, I recognize this lot. But, and then we suddenly clicked. We'd just been in the room where they'd been smoking it all in that lot. So we just kind of inhaled it all in that lot. Anyway, there was a big blow up. 
I challenged my friend that he hadn't dealt with his partner's death, that this drug use was destroying, had already destroyed another relationship he'd had, and that um, he needed to get a grip and that. And um, there was some real animosity. And I also found out this same guy who was spreading his rumours actually thought that I shouldn't be on this world and would have threatened to kill me. He wanted to knife me in the neck. Um, and um, even my ex-partner came down and said, you know, what's this about, you know? I said, look, if I put my last three boyfriends in hospital, that means you. Did you ever go in hospital? <laughs> oh, no. I said, no, okay, you know. Um, and, um, but I just thought, this is what the stuff does to you. And I thought, is it worth it? Is it worth that time? Because the worst thing we haven't really talked about is the come down. Mm. Oh, but it kind of, oh God, sweating. Freezing cold day going off to work and you'll be sweating like a bloody pig in that block, wouldn't you? You know, an horrible <laughs> one. I used to get really bad acid reflux and stuff like this. And you think, oh God, is it all worth all this lot? Um, you thought everybody loved you, then you realise everybody hated you. Um, and so I said, okay, that's, that's it. You know, if this is what drugs gonna do. So we, I actually, me and the young guy, we came back to London separate and I changed our tickets because I did not want to even travel on the same train as the other group. I didn't, you know, the guy, this friend was saying, oh, yeah. I said, no. We may be in a different carriage or whatever, but I don't even want to be on the same train because if the guy is threatened to, I don't want to be in there. So we kind of came back and I thought, okay, it's, it's crunch time. How serious am I about really wanting to stop this lot? Um, and I thought, yes, it's got it, you know, I had drugs in the house, you know, for a few weeks and so forth. Didn't use it. They could, they could be there. I didn't have to use them, but just having them there, you think, yeah, okay, you know, if you want, yeah. So I went over to my little box. I got some kitchen towel, put it on my table, poured out the crystal meth I had out, poured out the ketamine onto it, got my pipe, rolled it all up. And crushed it all up and I thought you know there's no way anyone can then see what's glass and what's drugs and that lot and just threw it away the following day this friend sent an email out to six of my friends and so forth and said um, I won't remember the good times with Jim but I don't want anything else to do with him I want no <laughs> contact with him and that was a 15 year friendship, just. Just gone. Um, but for myself, it was, it was that release thinking, no, I, I need to do this. I never let the drugs control me. I always controlled the drugs and I was the, I was, I was the boring one who set the alarm clock so we wouldn't take the G GBH more too soon than an hour or things like this. Um, the crazy thing was, a little later that night, the young guy that came back with us, oh, do you think we can get some pot? <laughs> no, we cannot. <sighs> so, you know, that's, you know, basically how and why I stopped. I realized I had my san sanity I don't know, I suppose with my Christian on the Christian walk, yes, it affects that, you know. Um but um you know, on that whole you you can say some weird things when you're on, on camps. But whenever the thing about God came up it's whoop, and that, you know, you, you never confess you were a Christian. And that. Um anyway, you've been coming to Oasis. 
for a while. You know, how, d how did you, you know, come in contact with this motley crew? <laughs> um, as I say, one of the things that I missed um, when I was using was that communion with God. Mm. I felt that there was an emptiness in my life. I felt that the drugs were slowly eating away at my soul and I was just becoming a shell inside. Um, to look at me outwards and appearance wise, I, you know, I looked fine. I could pass, I got, you know, to do that. But inside I was just a complete mess mm -hmm. and I was an empty shell. There was just basically nothing. And that fed more into my low self-esteem. So I thought there's nothing worthwhile in me as a person. So um, I met an individual at an, uh, a CMA meeting because I went to CMA for a while, which is Crystal what? Meth Anonymous, yeah. um, which is, I think there's a meeting on every day in London now mm -hmm. because it's become such a problem. Yeah. Um, and I remember speaking to one guy there um, and he'd been to Oasis once mm. and we were talking about Christianity and God before the meeting start and that sort of stuff and he was sort of saying about he was talking about evangelical and he kind of missed that and all that sort of stuff anyway I had not seen him for ages and then <coughs> I remember in must have been the beginning of 2017 mm. I got in touch with I've been going to CMA for about a year um, and I got in touch with this guy and he says, oh, well, I know a, good, a really good church. He says, you can go to it's Oasis in Waterloo. And I said, oh, I've never heard about it. I said, well, you come with me. And he says, yeah, I'll go with you that morning. So he came here that morning. Um, before that, he had introduced me to Dave and we'd had a lengthy chat about my story um, about a week or two weeks before that. Um, I think that, yeah, I think it was January or February 2017. Um, the pastor, um, Steve Chalk, that morning he was speaking and one of the subjects he mentioned was chemsex. Mm. And then if you've been at that service, you knew about the things he put up on the wall. He was talking about um, Pompeii and, yeah. and how there was such a problem with chemsex back in those days as well which is the same thing as what's happening now in London. Mm. Um, and wow, that God was definitely speaking to me about that, in that meeting. I don't know about anybody else, but I felt I was the only one sitting there. And I remember going to, um, to Dave afterwards and I challenged Dave and I said to him, did you tell the pastor that I was coming here today? Because I said, <laughs> he said, oh, no, 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 I didn't. I said, well, that, that message was definitely <laughs> for me. He was speaking to me, he wasn't speaking to anybody else. No. Um, so that's how I became uh, involved with Oasis. Mm. What about yourself? Um, it, my connection didn't really have anything to do with, with the drug chems use. Um, I obviously don't live not far down the road and that lot and heard about this place called Oasis. Various friends had started coming here and so forth. And one Saturday morning, I'll try again. One Sunday morning, um, I thought, well, you know, okay, let's let's give this place a go. We see what you know what's going on here and that, and then met up various people. Um, yeah, there's been quite a few sermons. <laughs> <laughs> you had to kick up the, the proverbial, mm. um, and um, so you know that's how my kind of involvement with with Oasis, such you know, mm. really went on from there. As I said, I always m made sure I didn't come to church, kind of wired or whatever it was, you know, or raising around that. One amusing thing, I belonged to a gay bridge group, which meet on a Wednesday, and this one Wednesday I was down to do the catering, and the catering was 20 people, and I went to this friend's place and I was completely wired. Cooking for 20 people was very interesting. Um, so, um, Marks, these are not injection lines. <laughs> um, I was doing some work and got things, but 
there are sometimes yes when you inject they can lit that seeds just look rather <laughs> do that thing. Um, but you know bruising you know you get paranoid you know to go to work and that lot um, and it was just something you know we just never talked about it. you know we don't talk about this kind of thing you know and just keep it hidden you know when I became a Christian I was about 13 years of age um, living in Northern Ireland, going to a Brethren church, which was extremely strict. Um, I think when I got down on my knees that time and I prayed mm. in the toilets and asked God to either take my life or save me, I thought that either I would die or that God would bring me to a church and everything would be hunky-dory and all the rest of it. It didn't work that way because I had to go, I went to CMA for a um, couple of years and I basically had to learn how to sit in a group mm. of gay men and still have my clothes on. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, mm. it, it was very easy for me, you know, I, I remember parties in my house and the person come to the door and he said right yeah put your clothes in there type of thing drugs are in there yeah. and it was just so matter of fact and it had I had to go and I had to learn some lessons in CMA about how to interact with people again um, mm. so I think you know if I would went my way and gone back to a church I probably would have stumbled more often than not and I do believe that God brought me into CMA first of all to calm my brain down, to link me back in again, to allow me to speak and express myself. And, and you do go through a traumatic change when you're going through that period type of thing. But I did get to that stage in my life where it wasn't enough. Mm -hmm. This time round, I feel a lot closer to God now than what I did. Mm -hmm. It's not, for me, it's not, um, it's not a set of rules that I follow it's a love that I have in here for him for the Lord Jesus Christ mm. and that's changed mm -hmm. because I've seen what he's done in my life I actually did come across this you know when this guy that I said was in relationship when we were saying that um, when our deal told us we're both, you know, using too much and you know, everything. Believe it or not, actually, I have done some counselling training. I worked for three and a half years at a second stage Christian rehab centre, um, and so I recognised kind of addictive and uh, addictions and that lot. What I did with this with this guy was put him in contact with the local um, substance abuse. Um, organization which you can usually find online depending on what borough you live you live in and so forth but the thing is they need to want to do it I gave this partner the ultimatum that you know you can't keep doing this and he says yes I'll go along but it was actually thrown back and eventually I had to turn around and say look it's either me or the drugs and he chose the drugs you do learn to become a fantastic liar when you're, uh -huh. um, when mm -hmm. you're taking drugs. Um, and what I would say is you can't support somebody financially no. because you're actually helping them in their drug use by mm. giving them money. Mm -hmm. Even if that amounts to them going onto the street and, and some people some people go down that route. And, and mm -hmm. the sad thing about it is, is some people, the end of their journey is they yeah. die from an overdose mm -hmm. and that's just the way it is and that's the hard thing about it yeah you know i know three people last year who died um and it's really really hard and one of the guys i was in love with mm -hmm. and my last words to him was um as he left my house that i loved him he died on the 22nd of december he thought one more time one more time will be fine he didn't have mm -hmm. that one more time mm -hmm. you know and it's such a dangerous. The problem with crystal meth nowadays, in London, they're actually 
putting other drugs into it. Mm -hmm. There's another drug, I can't remember the name of it, mm -hmm. which they're adding to crystal meth, and a very minute part of that drug will kill you, mm -hmm. and you won't know what it's in. And so it's becoming more dangerous. Right. I think uh, uh, the worst thing about is in London, and I think if you're not a user, if you've not been a user, you don't mm -hmm. realize this. Mm -hmm. There are school teachers out there who are using this. Mm -hmm. Primary school teachers who are using this. People at NHS are using it. You know, and mm. you will never know because most mm. of them are what we call functioning addicts. Mm. But eventually, that scale tips, mm. and then something happens. Something happens.